So welcome. Again, my name is Dr. Mizani. Welcome to Mary Clerkships, AC Medical. And we're going to be covering the part two of our two-part series on preparing for residency interviews during COVID pandemic. This is part two of a two-part series webinar that we're posting here for you online. Welcome everybody. And thank you so much, Mr. Cody Fan, for moderating our webinar here today. In part one of our webinar series, we covered hot trends in the 2021 match, such as value, resilience, adaptability. These are all fueled by COVID-19 pandemic. And we also discussed supplemental residency applications, and then some of them had really, really quick turnarounds. We talked about online skills assessment, and we talked about online interviews and social media and websites. And we realized that the online interviews portion was just too big, and that's why we created part two of this webinar. Online interviews, questions, and concerns. One of the, the most common questions that we were asked is, how do I prepare for these online interviews? Of course, practice, practice, practice. You know, it's easy to say, but the more that you do it, the better you'll become in developing your own style, your own approach, and how you like to go ahead and allow your own personality to come up in these webinars and these online interviews. You want to choose a quiet and distraction-free location. For example, here, this is our conference room, quiet, nobody is around. And so this is the reason why I picked this location. And you want to prepare for the interviews. I like to usually go back through my application and go through everything. And it's amazing how many things we forget about. And, and it's really because we get so nervous before the interview starts, but it's a really good idea to really take a look at all of the, the, the entire package and just remind yourself about your letter writers, the content of the letters. What does your MSPE look like? What did you say in your ERAS application? Every single one of the components of your ERAS application, take a look at it. And then as you do that, I want you to go to the website of the residency program and I want you to start to draft questions, questions which are very individualized to that program. And so come up with anywhere between five to 10 questions and you begin to prepare for that online interview. Then you want to test your connection. If you look at part one, You'll notice that there was a participant who had a question and then her in, her internet stopped and during the process as i was trying to evaluate her surrounding the internet stopped and that was a situation where you certainly do not want to be in so test your connection make sure you have a wired connection and you're not using wireless you want to watch carefully for virtual interview instructions by the programs not every one of them are going to be using zoom not every one of them are going to be using google meet because of <laughs> apologize for all of this and this is the other thing you want to make sure you turn off your phone see that's the reason why we do this apologize for the distraction you want to make sure there's no distractions whatsoever something like this and i didn't even know that my phone was because my phone was off your my phone is connected to my apple computer so as i'm having this presentation with you all my computer started ringing because it's functioning as my secondary device. See how you can turn it off. I don't know how to turn it off on my computer. I'm gonna have to figure it out after this is done, but this was a good learning lesson. Turn off any distractions coming into your laptop, any distractions going into your phone, test your connection, watch for instructions, and dress professionally. I would dress the same way as you would if you're going to an in-person interview. You wanna make eye contact just like this, not video contact because you could have your video that is located somewhere maybe down here on the bottom right corner of your screen and you keep watching yourself and you're not looking at the camera but if you if you really absolutely must look at your video which is a good idea take your video bring it right underneath the camera and then so you're constantly looking at the video and looking at the camera at the same time so you're making eye contact i think that that is very effective you want to consider body language. Body language is going to be there. Contrary to common belief that I can't see your body language in a video interview, I actually can. Just like right now, you're seeing my body language. So you can be engaged or you could be very, very standoffish. And so make sure that you are considering your body language and relax, right? You And this is, this is going to be fun after the process starts and you're going to start feeling like yourself. And you're going to notice that it's really not that much of a difference between an online and an in-person. And if anything, it's probably a little bit more relaxing because you don't have to worry about travel, the expenses. What if I don't show up on time? It's a lot better. So relax. You're going to enjoy and have a backup plan for the interview just in case your laptop breaks down, your Internet goes out, your desktop starts to update right in the middle of your interview right before it. You have a phone call that comes in in the middle of the interview have a backup plan so that you could 
jump right back into the interview, apologize if anything happens, come back in and conduct your interview again. And then you want to follow up afterwards. Following up afterwards, we're going to have specific webinars that will cover those. And then, of course, you want to have a backup plan for the match by planning for the soap. On November 14th, we are going to have another webinar on how to best plan for soap, which is really the final opportunity to match this match season. Everything is really, really accelerated this year. So we've lost five weeks in the beginning. So we have to prepare for supplemental offer and acceptance program by November 14th. So let's jump right into the questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to time myself so that I am spending no more than one minute per response. Now, the idea here is not to go through every single one of exactly how you're going to respond, but it's really to give you an idea of how to approach it. Tell me about yourself is one of them. And really with any interview question, what you want to do is you want to limit yourself to one minute, but how do you do that as you're trying to monitor what you're saying and you're thinking about what are you going to talk about? And so there's all these distractions that are coming in. So how, how do you do that? And so the, the best way that I've learned how to do it is to limit your responses the four components. And when you limit it to four components, it becomes a lot more manageable and you can answer things in one minute. And so tell me about yourself. I really don't want you to jump right into why you went to medical school and why you want to be a family physician and why you want to be an internist. I believe in my opinion that that's the wrong approach. I think, tell me about yourself. We want to know about everything around from your family, from your siblings. Why did you move to the United States? Those are all the things that, that we want to know about. So tell me about yourself. You, you can start to sound like your personal statement. You can start to sound like a URS application. You can start talking about things that you really didn't get a chance to talk about in either one of those. I, re I recommend the latter. Why our program? Why are you interested in our program? Why did you apply to our program? You know, the best way to answer this is through the questions that you prepare for the program before you, you get into the interview. And once you do that, then you'll figure out what are some of the synergies between you and the program. And that's the best way to respond to why did you pick our program? Why do you want to move to a particular state? Usually the best response to this is if you live in that state or if you've been there or if you have family, and then if you don't have those, then if you have family and friends, and then if you don't have any of those, then you know, of course you can resort to, or this is where your residency program is. So of course I'm going to move here. And so you can't really get too creative with that. And most of us don't have family and friends in the states that we have applied to because most of us have applied. Uh, you know, just we submitted a blanket application across the country. And in that situation, then of course, we have to resort to, well, this is where your program is located. And don't try to make that state sound so incredible and so beautiful, especially if you've never been there before, or, you know, make it sound like you're really open up, you know, opening up to trying new things. I think anything that's, that's very generic sounding, it's very cliche. And so don't do that. I think just stick with the basics. Don't get too creative. Why this particular specialty? The best way to respond to this is, relying on your own experiences. When you do mock interviews with AmeriClerks, with myself, with our interview coaches, one of the things that we'll constantly tell you is, please do not memorize your answers. We want you to rely on your experiences. And so when a question like this comes up, why did you pick family medicine? I want you to just click on pause, rewind in your memory and think about it. It's just you're like you're replaying everything that had to do with family medicine and you just go to the most recent family medicine experience and then you describe it the things that made you happy the things that got you excited you're like this is exactly why i went to medicine that's why you pick family medicine that's why you pick internal medicine that's why you pick cardiothoracic surgery so the competitiveness of the program or the specialty doesn't really matter we just want to know show us proof that you really meant to apply to the specialty and you didn't apply to multiple specialties. That's what that's really trying to gauge. If you start to say, for example, of the wrong answer to this why specialty, let's say it's a family medicine program. And you say, well, I'm applying to family medicine because I want to have a, you know, I want to have an exposure to a broad base of pathologies. Well, don't you really get a broad base of pathology exposure in both internal medicine and family medicine and pediatrics and OBGY and really in every specialty? So what is it about family medicine that excites you? And so that's why you have to go back to the experience and you can answer it then. Why have you not taken your step three exam, although you've graduated more than three years ago? I'm not too worried about this question. Programs that are so concerned about step three, they can, they can be. And I, I don't recommend that you take step three un unless you've had multiple attempts at the USMLE. 
And even in that case, I would still be extremely cautious in taking step three because it is a very high stakes exam, not required for getting into residency. And some of the programs recommend that just because they want to get you off their back or they want to go in and filter somehow. And just so there's less people they got to look at. And for those programs, that's OK. If you know, if there are 600 internal medicine programs across the country, fine. If you're going to lose out on 10 percent of them that are looking at step three, fine. So what? You have another 540 programs that you don't have to worry about step three. And so if a program ever asks that question, I don't see a correlation between graduating more than three years ago and passing step three. You know, uh, it, what really matters is your clinical experience. And so if they say, why have you not taken step three and you've done U.S. clinical experience, you can very easily say, you know, I, I would rather keep step three for internship so that I really get prepared for it properly. But what I've done is I believe what you're concerned about is patient contact or, you know, how, how rapidly I can respond to various medical scenarios or how familiar am I with the U.S. healthcare system. And because of that, I've completed so many weeks of U.S. clinical experience and I'm already in, for example, internal medicine, postgraduate sub internship right now. And that's how I've addressed my gap since I graduated from medical school. So not by passing step three, but by continuing with patient contact. That's a proper way to respond to this. What leadership roles do you possess? Give an example of a situation where you had to lead by example. I had a, a scenario yesterday. I was in a mock interview yesterday where I asked about this. And the only leadership role that, that this member of American Clerkships had was one time in her entire life, which was when the physician made her the lead medical student the head medical student during her clinical rotations. And so, of course, a response like that is not going to be too appealing because we can poke holes in that all day long. And so you can't really get away from that. And so you must develop leadership skills. And leadership does not necessarily mean that you were a leader by title. It could be where you led a team, a group, or you were part of a group, you accomplished something in commonality. So my recommendation is, for example, give an example of a situation where you had to lead by example. You can very easily go to the American College of Physicians, see if there's any subcommittees that you can join. And when you're there, you can participate, give your opinions, see if you can join groups, political action committees. Those are the type of things that we want to see. So again, not necessarily you were the CEO of a company or that you were the chief of something, but we just want to see how do you lead by example. Tell us about hardships. You know, one of the members said tough experiences you have faced in your life and how did you overcome them? This is very personalized for every person. And I think that the best way to approach this would be not to pick something that is very sad, not something that was absolutely crushing, but something that you survived. First of all, don't pick something that you are still dealing with. Like, for example, don't talk about how you've had multiple attempts at the USMLE. This is not the time to talk about it. Don't talk about how you've had to go through the match multiple times. This is not the time. For example, in my situation about a hardship is when I was you know, almost 14 years old and I was almost drafted to the front lines of the Iran and Iraq war at the age of 14. And so just think about that. And so our entire family had to uproot everything. My sister, my mother, my dad, and we had to uproot right in the middle of my school year and we had to leave Iran. And so that was an incredibly tough time for us, but we made it. I'm here. Everything is fine. Family is great. And so that's an example of a hardship that you overcame. So don't get too sad and make sure you focus on things that have as a positive, happy ending. And so that's the way that you would respond to this question. Next question. Is there anything in your past you are most embarrassed about? Really, really tough question. And I think that depending on your personality, you may be able to get away with picking something that you're really embarrassed about. And how did you overcome it? Like, for example, right now, today in this webinar, my phone started ringing. It wasn't my phone. It was my laptop. Well, that was kind of embarrassing in the middle of this presentation. But, you know, how did I overcome it is important. And so we use it as an example of how to make sure that the same thing does not happen. But it was very appropriate for this presentation. That's how I connected everything together. So that made me embarrassed. But at the same time, I overcame it. So that's that was a good example, actually. What steps have you taken during COVID-19 pandemic to ensure you will be able to be successful during residency? I was really happy to see the number of questions that you all had asked in your registration forms that have to do with COVID-19. 
And I think that every interviewer is going to have that in the back of their mind or even in the front of their mind, and they're going to ask you or they're going to want you to hint at it somehow. So what steps have you taken during COVID-19 pandemic to ensure that you will be able to be successful during residency? I think one of the best ways to do this is if you were in clinical settings, if you were dealing with patients directly, you were taking histories, you were you got familiar with how to just, you know, the, the, how do you maintain an entire day of clinical assisting, of clinical rotations, of sub-internship, wearing a face mask, wearing, you know, full body suits, you know, shields. So it, it takes a different level of resilience and adaptability. And so I think that relying back on your clinical experiences during COVID, applicable clinical experiences, not just shadowing, not enough. Now, let's say that you've done li live online clinical experiences. That certainly is helpful as well because you still participated in groups. You saw what happened and you participated. A lot of you did participate. A lot of you did take histories and you spoke with the patients. You got to see what coronaphobia is, which is a diagnosis now. You can check PubMed, it's there. So you got to see what coronaphobia is and, and how did the physician deal with it and all of that. So really important that you capitalize on everything that you did during the pandemic. What are your future plans or interests? What do you see yourself in the next five to 10 years? Uh, this question came up yesterday in a mock interview. And I, <laughs> I I think it's a little bit tough to see ourselves in 10 years from now. I think right now we're lucky if we kind of see ourselves in the next one to three years because of the pandemic, because there's so many unknowns. And I think you, it's okay for you to focus on the pandemic with something like this. And what do you see yourself? I think for me, if I was in your shoes, I would want to make sure that I do really well as a PGY1. And just the underlying concern that am I going to be able to just do everything that is required of me as a PGY1. And then all you have to do is just kind of look back at your clinical experiences and see how everybody else did it without preparation. And then so the good thing is you have all this lead time to have prepared. You know, so that's how I would respond to this question. What have you been up to in the last 10 years? Great question. Very individualized. I think some of you have really good things that you've done. You've been practicing in your country or you've done a lot of recent clinical experiences. If you can't explain the previous nine, 10 years, you've been focusing on the previous one year and so really got back into patient contact and, and your application was you know front loaded with clinical experiences so that the, the reviewer, as we're looking at the CRS application, will consider you as someone who's, yeah, so there has been this gap. We'll deal with the gap, but let me see how they deal with a really tough situation or hardship. Maybe they had a really bad circumstance that they, they, they haven't told us about, but you know, they're fixed it and this is what they've done. So really focusing on recently what you've done pertaining to clinicals and patient contact in the United States is going to be critical. If you can explain what you've done in the previous 10 years, by all means, fantastic. Why do you think that you are a perfect candidate for our program? I think, uh, you know, with some of these questions, we do go a little bit overboard, like the perfect candidate. I, I don't think any program really believes that there are a perfect candidate, although, you know, we will ask it in a question and we'll, we'll prepare, prepare for it that way. But last year, years before, we would always focus on your strengths and your weaknesses. But I think this year we have to focus on value, adaptability. Uh, resilience, what have you done during COVID? So it's like the number one headliner news still pandemic is. So your adaptability and resilience is really important. And don't just throw out these terms. Don't just say I'm adaptable and I'm resilient. We want to see examples because otherwise then you're sounding generic because I'm sure everybody else in this webinar and during the interview is going to say the same thing. So think about some of the things that you've done during the pandemic and of course, pre-pandemic as well, but don't forget to talk about the pandemic. What is or are your major weaknesses? They could ask you for one weakness. They could ask you for multiple weakness. Yesterday, I kind of pushed my luck a little bit and I asked for five weaknesses. And so that was a little bit stressful for our interviewee, but she made it through and, and she, you know, we came up with some really good, we came up with great three weaknesses. And really the approach here should be that with your weakness, you want to identify something that you know, you hear that they've been working on, but it doesn't have to be something that is, that's just broken you or that you're really bad in, right? Weaknesses doesn't have to be that. It, it could be something that you're working on and you've improved upon and you're a stronger person as a result. So that's how I like to focus on the, the weaknesses. And next question, tell me about a particular thing that you've listed on your curriculum vitae, on your ERAS or your letter of recommendation. And the reason why I think this is a good question is because anything in your ERAS application is fair game. Anything in there is fair game for them to ask you questions about. And so hold yourself accountable for whatever is in there, even if you're surprised. Let's say that your letter of recommendation was waived and the letter writer made a mistake and they uploaded 
the wrong person's letter of recommendation or in the letter of recommendation there's something you know really terribly unexpected like for example they're recommending you to a different specialty than what you've applied to and that happens a lot believe it or not and so if they bring that up you certainly don't want to sound like well i don't know what happened or just be completely lost plan for those scenarios you know play devil's advocate and see how you would respond to it something like that i think the best rule of thumb is is being accountable for what you've written in your application and be ready to talk about it. If you look at your ERAS application before you get into the interview, and for all of you AmeriClerks members, we've put you through so many series of reviews and analysis and revisions in your application. And the reason why we constantly involve you is for moments like this, so that you can answer questions like this. But if you've not done it, yourself or you've just kind of very superficially filled out your application or you waive your right to every single one of your letters or you don't know what your MSB says or if there's inconsistencies in your entire application then of course that's how they'll get you what are your strengths try not to sound cliche and of course again the pandemic is important some of the things that I really like to focus on would be uh, the topic is clinical experience because we all want our candidates to have had patient contact before they start in the very recent ones. The, the, the longer it's been since you've contacted patients and you've treated anyone, then the higher the risk of morbidity and potentially mortality. And that's what we're really worried about is we want you to hit the ground running as soon as you start residency. And so when we're really asking about your strengths, what I'm really asking about is how do I know you're going to get this job done without me having to be too overly concerned, right? And so maybe talking about ACGME core competencies would be good. Using some of those trigger words that you and I have been working on for so many months together so that it's in your letter of recommendation. So it's in your ERAS application. So it's in your in your interview preparation as you're speaking about your experiences. And you can use it at times like this. So ACGME core competency itself, there's six right there. And from that, you pick any of the ACGME core competencies link it back to your clinical experience, and then you can talk about it. So for example, interpersonal communication skills. You communicated with patients, potentially with families before COVID or maybe over the phone. You communicated with nurses, especially if they translated for you, and you communicated with an interdisciplinary team, teams that you consulted, social workers, maybe home health visitors. And so that's how you worked on your interpersonal communication skills. And because you've done all that, that improves your systems-based practice, right? Because now you're familiarizing yourself better with the U.S. healthcare system and you know what are all the things that are offered. So you don't have to say, I'm a team player and, you know, and I'm, and I'm a hard worker. Okay, <laughs> I, I don't know what that means. So, but if you use ACG core competencies, then that's much, much more concrete, much, much more tangible and much more personalized. What do you do to cope with stress, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic? I think personal health right now is more important now than, than ever before. And so especially during COVID-19, because we could get so bogged down in just watching the news and try to catch up with headlines. And, and if we miss something on social media, we feel like we're, you know, we completely like we, a part of our life is gone and, and we feel left out. And, and so it's important that you pay attention to yourself and stress coping mechanisms have never been more important. You know, we hear people doing yoga. I myself, I, I started hiking more until the California wildfires happened. And of course the time change also, the time change was too dark in the morning so I could have hiked. But until then, until about a month ago, I would hike 15, 16 miles a week. And that was something that I hadn't done before. I pushed myself, I got up at five in the morning, I got up at three in the morning, by five and o'clock in the morning, I was on the trails and I was hiking with a friend of mine. And that was really good. Cleared my mind, bounced ideas off of him. He was another physician, bounced ideas off of him, talk about, you know, difficulties, challenges. I saw that I'm not the only person with, with all these stresses, see how he deals with it. I kind of use mine. He uses my experiences and it's a really good stress coping mechanism. So you probably have your own way of dealing with it. So I recommend that you, you start thinking about it. How can you add to the value of this program? What do you have to offer to our program? This is a little bit of everything. This is a little bit of your experience. This is a little bit of your strength. This is a little bit of what you did during COVID. This is a little bit about your communication skills. This is a little bit about your wisdom. Uh, and what kind of value can you add to the program is really, it's, it's, it's a newer concept. Uh, what do you have to offer to our program is what we used to ask before, but value add is, is a newer concept in residency interviews. And it's uh, it's becoming okay for programs to really 
think of how you're going to make them a stronger program. Because until the pandemic started, everybody looked at the residency program as the end all be all in the graduate medical education field. And then the pandemic started and we saw how some of our program directors were not even able to come into the hospital because they were at risk. We started seeing how the third year residents that just became third year residents a few months ago, now they had to take really serious leadership roles. And then our second year residents began to function a little bit like somewhere between the second and the third year residents. All the milestones started accelerating without anybody even knowing, but we had to do that. We had to step up to the plate. Knowing that that those things can be done and, and it is humanly possible, then we want to know how, what do you bring to the program? What kind of value do you add so that you're not constantly relying on the program, but the, rely, the program can rely on you and other people can rely on you. Kind of just a little bit of leadership, right? You may not have had a leadership role in the past, but the but we all got it in us, you know? And one of the best ways, I think this will probably resonate to all of the parents, we were never trained on how to raise kids. You know, I, I was in residency and I, I kind of laughed at myself when I had my first uh, child, my son. And I said, how did I give advice to, to moms and dads when I was in family medicine residency? I had no idea what I was talking about, like until I became a parent. And so these innate attributes within you kind of come out when, when there are emergencies and under stress. And so we want to know if you can tap into those. So, so this is again, a very, you know, it's a very personal question to each one of you. And you got to figure out what it is that that value that you can bring. And if you're having a tough time, by the way, on the bottom left, we have a link over there, expert interview prep, and that's directly with myself and our interview coaches. I'll talk a little bit towards the end about our mock interview and our interview boot camps. And, and if you see that our interview boot camps are filled or our mock interviews are filled, we still, you can do direct one-on-one -on -one interview prep with me through private consultations, either non-urgent or urgent. So there's three ways for you, four ways for you to get in touch with us during these times. But if you're an AmeriClerkship member and you have an interview, we're not going to fail you. We're, we're going to find time to to provide you that interview prep service. So, you know, take a look at that at the end of this webinar so that you, you're focusing on this and know that we're there for you so that you're not alone with all of these really tough questions. So next question, why did it take you more than one attempt to pass USMLE? And this could be step one, step two, step three, whichever. And I think it's much more important that you passed it if you've had multiple attempts. And let's say you pass step three, I would say, well, yes, I've had multiple attempts. However, let me, just let you know that I did pass step three, so you don't have to worry about me not passing a USMLE ever again. And so that's one of the ways to deal with it. But if there were other attempts, then we kind of have to think about what happened. And it's, it's not enough just to say, well, you know, I had to kind of get used to the exam. You know, we need to dig a little bit deeper into that. But again, it's a dangerous question. You don't want to hang around this question for too long. You don't want to say, well, I was disappointed at myself. Of course you were disappointed. I don't know of a single person that is not disappointed when they don't pass USMLE on the first attempt or complex for our osteopathic doctors here in this presentation. And so, you know, we got to figure that out. That's a little bit more tougher question to answer. And we need some one-on-one -on -one time with that. How did the pandemic affect your choice of a program? Really interesting question. This was asked in the registration page. With this, a lot of our members, what they did, they started focusing on programs that were closer to their families so they didn't have to travel much. But we also saw the flip side. For those that had families, some just wanted to completely separate so they don't put their families at risk. And they wanted to go to a completely separate location, not around their neighborhood so or their or their city or anywhere where they would be tempted to come right back, you know, visit multiple times and put their families at risk. So we're seeing, you know, both ways in how the pandemic affected the program choice. But for the most part, so that those are the, the, the outliers. For the most part, everybody's still applying across the country. So that's the reality. But now from programs perspective, how did the pandemic affect your choice of a program? What I would do in this case is I would treat this the same as why did you apply to our program? I would find what they stand for, what their mission, what their vision is, what their goals are, what my values are that I bring to the program. I'll try to you know, create some synergies between the two. And then I will focus on what the program has done during the pandemic, go on their social media, watch their videos, see what the residents are saying, see what's, what they talk about in the news. And then I will talk about, well, the reason why I applied to your program is this. So not necessarily talking about all the other programs, I would just re, I would just recenter it again onto the program that you're having the interview at and, and focus it on, on there. What were you doing when the pandemic began? This came up so many times a couple of weeks ago in the NRMP transitions to residency and other transition to residency webinars as well, meetings, symposiums, which are all online. 
And the one thing that they're looking for is they want to know how you were involved during the pandemic. If you just sat home and did nothing or you didn't do anything until like a month ago, then probably not going to look too well. For all of you AmeriClerkship members, we've been trying to drill this in everybody's mind and heart and body and soul that, look, don't just sit back, get in there, get involved. It's not a good idea for you to just kind of sit back and not do anything. And one of the things that we also saw is when U.S. medical schools canceled clinicals, right, in-person clinical clerkships, medical students got really upset because they wanted to be involved. And so think back to all of those times and how you felt and when you saw the pandemic come and and that's what we've been trained to do, right? That's what we that's why we're in this profession. We're the soldiers of medicine. And so as a soldier of medicine, did you go out there to the front line and what did you do when you did or you didn't do anything and you just sat back? What have you been doing since the start of the pandemic? It's kind of a similar question, but this just talks about afterwards, like once the pandemic started, then what did you do? During what did you have what were you doing during the pandemic? That was the previous question. That's a separate question. What have you done? As, as of the start of the pandemic, so now you saw the pandemic, let's say you weren't in a clinical setting, but now you saw the pandemic happen. Did you then mobilize yourself and, and do something about it? And then what did you do for your community? And that's what we're really looking for, is how involved did you get in your community or were you really just worried about yourself and your family? How has COVID affected the way we practice medicine? Now we are now testing your familiarity with US clinical experiences during the pandemic. And so you may have and if you just go ahead and say, well, we were using a lot more telemedicine or, uh, you know, you tell me some of the things that I, I hear all the time in the news, then I know that you probably haven't had some proper clinical experiences. But if you really get down to the nitty gritty and you really get to the details of how it's affected the way we practice medicine, then I know you've done something about it. So, again, go back to your clinical experiences. Think about some of the minutia. Just just imagine all the things that the residents were going through, the attending physicians were going through, the practices that were closing, of course, telemedicine, how were the patients feeling? I mean, just all of that. And I want that. I want you to bring all of those in. Put some emotion behind it so that we know that you actually experienced it and it's affected you as well. You could hear, what can we do to minimize COVID transmission? Of course, you can say face mask, but you know, I'm not sure if that's all the programs are looking for. Uh, but you got to say the the cliches first, face mask, social distancing, of course, you got to do that. However, how do you do social distancing when you have to examine the patient in person, right? You know, if you need to examine the patient's mouth, how do you keep the face mask on the patient? You know, you have to think about these things. And there may not be a perfect answer to a question like this, because if there was a perfect answer, then maybe we wouldn't be in the situation that we are right now. And so we, you have to respect the gravity of the, of the pandemic and that we don't have all the answers, but what are some of the, 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 the things that you're thinking about? Again, this kind of comes back to your values that you bring to the program in helping to minimize the overall transmission, but be creative, think about ways that we haven't thought of before. And that's how you distinguish yourself from all the other candidates. Has your daily routine changed because of the pandemic? And if so, how? I don't know of a single person whose daily routine has not changed. So be honest, tell us how it's changed. Hopefully you, you're in a clinical setting and you continue to be in a clinical setting until at least end of next February, because that way you can answer these questions properly, easily. You can say that I'm in a clinical setting and why not to be in clinical settings where you're jeopardizing your future. For example, if you do not have professional liability insurance, please don't put yourself on the front lines where you're examining patients and you're taking histories, you know, don't, don't do that because a lawsuit can happen at any time. And I just, you know, I can just see it in like about a year from now, maybe even sooner, just the onslaught of lit litigations that are going to start happening for all the negligence by physicians or by other healthcare workers and, and the attorneys are going to have a field day. So make sure that you're always protecting your self right from an insurance perspective you're in the right setting don't do something just because the physician said it's okay you can go ahead and examine patients don't introduce yourself as doctor everywhere you go those are very concerning red flags because then you could potentially be practicing medicine without a license when you're really trying to help so think if you're an American Clerkship member, please come to my office hours so we can talk about it. But alternatively, I know we all have connections and networking and, and we're just looking for a clinic to go in there and start to, to work and not, maybe not even get paid. 
but make sure that you're protecting yourself first. You need to be insured. Number two, don't practice medicine without a license. And number three, be in settings. Once you do something for four weeks, get up and leave. Go to the next clinical site. Get up and leave. Go to the next clinical site so nobody would ever be able to t say that, look, you've been working there. You were not just a volunteer. So some, some tips on how to deal with that. But what are your daily routine change? Preferably within different clinical sites. And you can talk about how those clinical settings have changed. If you're not in a clinical setting, get in a clinical setting. <laughs> really important. How have you contributed to the fight against COVID-19? Again, you know, there's some creative ways that, that our members have, have uh, contributed to the fight. I can just go on and on forever in some of the stories that we've heard and some of the contributions that our members have made within each one of the clinical sites. I can go on forever talking about physicians and how grateful they are for our members being at their clinical sites in AmeriClerkships, having us sent them there. I can go on for days for the donations, for example, that AmeriClerkships has done for N95 masks, so all these hospitals and clinics. Those are the things that you've done to contribute. And so think about the things that you've done, personal volunteering. Did you go to a homeless shelter? Did you go to a food bank? Were you in the front lines in New York when, when everything was shut down? Your contribution during COVID-19 is is going to be critical. Another fantastic question over here. As we reopen businesses and the American society, what can be done to minimize the spread of COVID-19? Very similar to the previous question. And so it's an invigorating thought, which we already covered. Tell me about a difficult case or stressful patient encounter that you have had and how you handled it. If you've been in COVID, I recommend that you focus on on COVID patients, not doesn't have to be necessarily COVID positive. It could be just any interesting COVID scenario. What is interesting is uh, I heard from some of our members and they said, well, I can't think of an interesting case or scenario. I, I don't know how that's possible, right? Especially right now, I just don't see how that's possible. And so even if you had a shadowing experience, even if your attending physician in a telerotation did not allow you to speak with the patient, you still were involved and you heard what happened and you heard from the patient and you heard it from their voice. And I want you to talk about that. And I want you to, I want you to tell me what your treatment plan was and how would you handle that in, if you were in the physician's shoes. So those are the extreme situations where if you were not fully engaged or involved, uh, or you didn't speak with the patient directly, but you were still there. And then all the way to the other extreme end, like for example, our postgraduate sub internships, where you are right there admitting COVID positive patients, getting into full suits, isolation gowns, isolation rooms, and being in an intensive care unit, those are stressful, right? The times that there were, there was a shortage of face masks and just, I can go on and on. So those are the, the stressful situations that you can talk about, but don't focus too much on the negatives. I want you to talk about how did you overcome them? Really important, that shows resilience. What are the top five things you'd educate patients on about COVID? And then second part of that about the pandemic, two different things, COVID is a virus, pandemic is the, you know, it's, it's a spread and it's effect on, on the entire globe. And so what would you tell the patients about COVID? You want to focus on, on COVID and its transmission. What do you want to talk about the pandemic? You can talk about its global effect and how they're not alone. And maybe one of the things you want to talk about, the one thing I really heard, which was really good in, in some of the letters of recommendation we were assisting our physicians with was they were really impressed by those individuals that even if the patient didn't talk about COVID and how the pandemic has affected them, our members still asked about, you know, how is the pandemic affecting you? And they were really impressed with that. So I would discuss that. Why do you wish to come to America? Personal, I'll leave this one up to you. <laughs> you know, everybody has a different reason. What has been your best accomplishment so far? Some talk about their their kids, right? If they have if they they have to have children. Some talk about where they are today and they've been able to prepare for the match if the process was not too cumbersome and not too problematic because then if you start to talk about a problematic process you're inviting them to ask you questions remember anything that exits your lips is fair game for us to ask you about so if you're going to talk about accomplishments also be prepared for us to ask you any questions about it so i would i would focus on on probably family would be good kind of tells us a little bit about the other side of you. For those of you that have really good medical student performance evaluations, the noteworthy characteristics are really good. Those are those three noteworthy characteristics, the proper ones, not the ones that say that you're a great team player or you've done fantastic in your didactics. Those are not noteworthy characteristics. Noteworthy characteristics are extracurricular things that you've done during your medical education. And so I think that that's a good point of reference for you to, to see what, what was said there. Again, these are all about preparing, right? So if you had prepared that part of your residency application, then you can answer a question like this. All we're doing is we're 
helping you connect the dots. You don't have to memorize anything. We're just helping you connect the dots so you can tap into the right experience and talk about it. Visualize it. I want you to visualize your experience. Nobody can take that away from you. So don't memorize, visualize. What is the harshest criticism you handle and how? I'm trying to think of myself. I'm sure I've gotten tons of, of oh, well, I can't, okay, I'll, I'll give you one. When I became the chief resident at Morehouse, about a month into it, my program director sat down with me and the, and the chairwoman of the program, they both sat down with me and they said, look, I think we're going to take this chief away from you, this position. And I was just shocked. I didn't understand how, how what, what did I do? I thought I was doing everything right. And what I did is they said that I was being too harsh on the residents. I was being too pushy. And what I did is because we were not getting our schedules back on time and everybody was just waiting for, you know, until the last moments to turn in their, you know, what they can do, what days they can and they cannot. And so we can negotiate days off and days on and who's going to be on call and who's going to cover the floor, et cetera. And so I, I gave them a deadline and I said, look, if you don't tell me this until, you know, two weeks before, I'm going to go to make the decision. And that really upset a lot of people. And so their criticism was I was being too harsh, I was being too aggressive. And they felt that that was not, you know, qualities the chief resident would have. I acknowledged that I was my mistake and I really learned from that on the spot. And I managed to talk them into not taking that away from me. And I really did a 180. And so I graduated as a chief resident. And, and so think about really, really harsh criticisms that are constructive, right? And they may not be constructive either, but how did you handle this important and how did you come up successful at the end. Do you see yourself in an academic institution or a private practice? It depends on the, you know, some, most of you are going to be researching. Hopefully all of you are going to research the program before the interview starts. And so when you do that, then you can see if they're an academic institution, then of course you are interested in an academic institution. If they're a private institution, then probably a private institution. Most of the programs do not care whether you want an academic career. Most of them do not care. But the ones that do, most likely they have a lot of fellowships. And so that's why they, they want you to kind of, once residency is done, are you going to focus on research? Are you going to focus on fellowship? Maybe. So it depends on where you're applying to and what is their setup. This was an awesome question. Are you willing and ready to handle COVID patients? I don't see anybody saying no to this, but I think that there's a two-part answer to this. You know, you have to really think about this. Don't just say yes. Right? Don't just spit it out. But I want to know reason why you're going to say yes or you're unsure, or you're going to say, no, I don't know what you're going to say, but I want you to think about it. And I want you to have a reason. I want to, I, I want to, I want to hear the way you think when you respond to this question. And that's going to tell me a lot about what kind of person you are. And are you willing and ready to handle COVID patients? Again, I can't fault you for either way, but if you say no, then we're really going to have, have a talk, what, whether this was the right specialty for you. And for some of you that decided to push your clinical still later and not do anything during COVID because of family concerns or your own concern of not contracting COVID, that is going to put you in a pretty tough situation here trying to answer this question. And then for those of you that went above and beyond and will it, were willing to risk yourselves and your lives and your health, and you went out there and you helped patients and you gained your clinical experience and, and you ended up with letters of recommendation and here you are today. I think that that experience answers this question 100%. What will you do if you contract COVID? 